when you have reached your limits. Does that not sound like a juxtaposition in the church? Telling God's people that believe that all things are possible, that I have reached my limits. And years I've read this text, and with anger, borderline anger, at the sons of Zebedee and their mother, how could you ask such a thing in the body of Christ? How could you ask that, that you, you give something and as precious as a moment as it was in the life of Jesus, can you ask that, 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 that at this moment we're going to move and, and Jesus, can you save a space so that my sons and daughters can sit on your right and left side. Now, now that the problem was, we look at it in that anger because we've seen the whole story. There's not a lot of need for extensive explanation to those that know Christ about who holds the seats of occupancy in glory. But at this time, the situation was so dire and difficult there it was, there was a current that was rising up through Judea, Samaria, Galilee, and in Jordan. That, that, that Jesus Christ was becoming a problem. People were tired of hearing that the old law was not in effect anymore. And there was a new law that you love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. People were tired of hearing that my good works are not enough to do it. People didn't want to hear the story that, that it's all about how I dress and how I come to church and whether my name is written on the book and the church rolls and how much I give to the local body. People were, were tired of hearing about a God that says everybody can be somebody. How could everybody be somebody? when we're created with different intellect? How could everybody be somebody when others have a deeper financial platform? How could everybody be somebody when I serve in a position and I got authority and it ought to mean something to somebody? How could everybody be somebody? Jesus was going through the land saying that it's not about how many cards you can layer on top of each other and how many doctors that you can visit, but there is healing in the name of Jesus. And they were getting tired of hearing about how is this man that was a borderline Samaritan, how is this man that was a Nazarene that really nobody of high reputation, how is this man whose father loan duty was was a carpenter that carved out and moved stuff. How do you have the nerve to say that there is power in the name of Jesus? So when the disciples, James and John, began to follow Jesus, don't think that it was all about a cake off, y'all. It wasn't a cake walk to be hanging out with Jesus. They, they had a cook off every now and then when Jesus fed the 5,000. But it was not a cook off every day. It, it was not a gathering at the pool and everybody was receiving riches on every day. It was not a naming and claiming type relationship with Christ because Christ knew that his coming was about more than money and manna, but his coming was about a devil that had already convinced two, a third of the heavenly host to go with him that are now demons that are going forth trying to destroy the very soul of mankind. He knew that it was about a devil that had one duty and it was a plural duty. He come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Jesus knew that he was fighting a devil that would not let up even in 2,000 years later. That devil is still rowing his head and showing off on every side and trying to conquer our families and our situations and our circumstances. He's trying to invade the ranks of our pulpits and choirs and in our 
our pews. He's trying to alter our theology. What used to be right doesn't seem right anymore. And what used to be wrong is all of a sudden right in the eyesight of man. So he knew that he would come and he would break the partition that every man and woman that desired to be saved could be set free by the blood of Jesus. The stakes were a high church. So when she asked that question, it was in part honor that Jesus, they're sitting around with you, hanging out in the upper room, walking on water, eating red snapper that you pull up out of the sea. They've been going from place to place. All of them have left their jobs and going out, talking about your goodness, and you're feeding them all. You're clothing them all. You're blessing them all. So she had saw that, and she said, I don't understand how they could hang around Jesus so long and not really hear what the Spirit was trying to say to the early church when he said that in three days he's going to tear down this tabernacle and he's going back to glory to build a new tabernacle when he kept telling them that I am my father's son and I'm coming to do the will of my father and I'm going to lay down my life because no man can take my life but I lay down my life for the sins of mankind so she finally got it and she said Jesus Jesus, I have realized that you are not here to stay, but that you are going back. And I realize that this world is not your world. I want to do the best I can to create clean water. I want to do the best I can to breathe nice, clean air. I want to do the best I can to make it better for the next generation. But if I tell you the truth, this world is not my home. I'm not getting too comfortable with streets made of asphalt when I got streets made of gold. I'm not getting too comfortable. Keep building and fixing stuff on that old decaying house when I got a mansion that'll never grow old. I'm not getting too hung up on pretty and how much I am in this world when I'm gonna put off this old body and I got a new body in glory that's gonna be perfected without mortality, without corruption. I'm gonna put on a new body in the household of the Lord. I like coming to worship with you every now and then in the church, but I'm not going to spend all my time here with you trying to win your approval because when I get to glory, I want to see them open up those doors and say welcome me in my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. Come and see what it feel like to be owner and ruler over many. So when she realized that this was not Christ's home, he was just here to do a job. She said, will you remember my sons when you get to thy kingdom? Then Jesus began to tell him and he delivered the ultimate compliment. Sometime I say, Lord, why you didn't make me where well, I could sing like Lee Williams? And the Lord said, if you were singing like Lee Williams, you wouldn't be working on your preaching. Somebody else said, Lord, I wish that I had strong legs so I could usher at the door of the Lord. And the Lord said, if you were an usher, we wouldn't be able to get you to sing in the choir. And we need to use your voice to glorify the Lord. There's somebody else that said, Lord, I wish that folk knew that I'm trying to give to the best of my service. And the Lord is saying, if everybody knew everything that you were doing, then your reward would come here on earth. And you wouldn't know what it feel like to have a reward built up in glory so when she was sitting there telling that story Jesus gave her the ultimate compliment when he said yes your son shall drink of my cup can you imagine what it feel like to be a mother to hear Jesus say your sons will be born again yes your sons will be baptized brother clock and demetra can you know how good it feel to know that your children will carry god's holy spirit everywhere they go yes your sons will be with me in paradise but the cup that you're asking for they have exceeded their limits 
the seat that you're asking for is not mine to give but God has laid a plan in place that who shall sit on that throne because if Zebedee's sons would have sat on that throne don't you know that there would be nobody to make intercession for you and I if Zebedee's sons would have sat on that throne there would be nobody in glory to tap that nail scarred hand savior and say don't you know that they need you doing this day and this hour if Zebedee's sons would have sat on that throne there wouldn't have been no room for my comforter the Holy Ghost that walks with me and talks with me and every now and then tell me I'm his own if Zebedee's sons would have sat on that throne then you and I could only be good men and good women but I thank God that heaven is reserved for God the Father, Jesus, that Holy Son, and the power of the Holy Ghost so that we can be more than just men and women. But when we come to God, we can be forgiven of our sins. We can be justified from our hurt. We can be set free from our downtrodden days. We can be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We can be welcomed home to a home not made by man. We can have eternal powers that what's bound on earth has been bound in heaven so I can call on my angels I can walk in God's favor I can operate in his grace I can be submerged in his healing I can be moved by the power of his shed blood I can always go to a fountain that's been filled with blood that's been dipped from Emmanuel's face and this sinner can plunge beneath that flood and watch the Lord cleanse all my guilty stains. I thank God that heaven is reserved for him. Now the good thing about there's nothing else left. Can you imagine what life would be if you and I had the power to sit next to Jesus and occupy that throne? How would we maintain our attitude and humility? Folks already giving themselves triple C, double duty, Messiah titles on the world right now. Can you imagine some TV preacher who was given the authority that he would sit on the right hand of God? He would be out there selling every ticket to the throne to make money off of people. Can you imagine if some lady had the power to be considered the greatest one that's going to sit on the right hand of God, walking around the office with her shoes off, bragging to everybody. Nobody would be interested in God, but we got a Savior who had no problem coming down and making himself a nobody and giving up everything so that everybody can be reconnected connected to God. I like to preach the gospel, but I realize when it comes to the soul of man, I have reached my limits, and my limit is I can't make nothing up. My limit is I can't lead you astray. My limit is I can't make it about me, but it's got to be about the power of God. It's good to be called to be a digging, but you got a limit. Your limit is you got to serve to the best of your ability but you don't own anybody you don't control anybody you don't have a deed on anybody's soul mothers I love that you're here to encourage the body of Christ but you got a limit you can't walk with that person you can't talk with that person you can't tell that person that God belonged to them and they belong to God because some things are reserved for Jesus that's why I don't want a God that gets me. I don't want a God that's like me. I don't want a God that's cool with me. I want a God that'll die for me. I want a God that'll live inside of me. I want a God that will redeem my broken soul. I want a God that'll be my everything. I, I, I remember and I accept my limitations because I'm so excited about what God has for me on the other side. I remember back in 1987 
And, and back in 1987, some of y'all might not know about this, but all of those teenagers around the 80s, you know what I'm talking about. East Bay running store started sending magazines out. And all the boys would look at the East Bay catalog and look at sneakers in the locker room in PE time, hoping that they can get them a pair of shoes out of East Bay. And back then, they didn't take credit cards or nothing that you, because you had to swipe the credit card with the carbon copy. So you would dial up the number 1-800-826-2205. And that's how much I didn't dial that number up, y'all. And East Bay would answer, and you would tell them what you wanted. And then you would tell them the number out of the catalog. And they would assign you a number. And then you had to get your parents to either send a check, a money order, or sign for a COD. And I remember I picked out a pair of Magic Johnson Converse. And I watched them Converse for about three weeks cut grass and weed eat it and did everything I could to save up that 5246 so that I could get them Magic Johnson Converse. And at that time, my daddy said, if you save the money, I'll send in the check. Well, I guess he would since I was giving him the money and he was writing the check. But, but I remember when he sent in the check, I called up the number. I said 1-800-826-2205 to Madison, Wisconsin. And the lady said, hello. And I said, my name is Mr. Lee. And I would like number 1312, the white Magic Johnsons. And I need them in a size nine and a half. Sent to me right away. And she said, sir, I've got your number. What's your address? I said, 2230 Mountain Road. 24558 sent them quick she said sir there's a coupon book in the back of your catalog if you would tear that coupon book out and send us a money order or a check for 42 I'm um, 5246 we're gonna send those sneakers out to you so when my daddy wrote that check off of Central Fidelity Bank and mailed it out I thought it might take about four days to get to Madison Wisconsin and oh I was excited and I was hurt at the same time Mr. Postman why you taking so long why, why you got to take it why you got to drive through cars is there any way we can get it a little faster but finally after about four days I called up that number again and I said I want to confirm that you have received that order for 1526 and she said yes sir Mr. Lee we received your check yesterday your shoes have been shipped and they now belong to you congratulations you're now the owners of Converse Magic Johnson edition and oh I felt so good when I hung that phone up walked that long cord back down the hall away and put it on the receiver in the kitchen and I began to think about it. I laid out my stonewashed Jordan's jeans and said I'm going to wear this one on Monday. I laid out my great Lee jeans and I said I'm going to wear this one on Tuesday. Then I said on Friday I'm going to put on my windsuit and I'm going to wear my Magic Johnson Converse and I might pull the right leg up just a little bit. But Tony you remember that and I'm going to walk around and be somebody but the more of the story was the minute she told me that my sneakers had shipped I knew that I was now an owner and I was excited about that day the minute she told me my sneakers were shipped I started making preparations to look good when I put my new shoes on I start imagining am I gonna tuck the laces inside am I gonna spread them out and layer them? am I gonna pop the tongue up over my jeans just what what am I going to do? How am I going to deal with it? Am I going to sit at the front of the bus so everybody can see them when they go off? Or am I going to walk down to the end of the bus so they can just marvel at those Magic Johnson sneakers? I hope somebody asked me, do I know Big Game James Worthy and A.C. Green and Byron Scott because I got my Magic Johnson sneakers? Well, let me tell you how that story prepared me for where I am today. The day that Jesus entered my heart I felt like I felt that day when that lady said you are now the owner of some Magic Johnson Converse don't you know that he has not come back yet but 
I know that that mansion is mine. Don't you know that the mailman man hadn't showed up yet? But I know that blessing is mine. I may have bills coming in the box, but I'm not worried because my deliverance, it is mine. I may have trouble in my life, but I'm not worried because my trouble-free life, it is mine. And I feel like the songwriter, I just want to see him. I just want to look upon his face. I want to get excited and I'll be there to sing forever of his saving grace. I'm going to one day going to be on the streets of glory and I'm going to lift my voice. Don't you know cares are going to be passed. We're going to be home at last. We're going to be able to rejoice. So we ought to be excited. I was laying out my clothes because I was waiting for that day. I was ironing up my shirts because I was waiting for that day. Well, if you've been born again, God has already written your name in the Lamb Book of Life. He's received the check that was paid at Calvary. He's assigned the ownership to you and it's yours all to keep. So you better get ready. So how do we get ready for God? Let him that have breath praise the Lord. How do we get ready for God? Let's dress up with the full armor of faith. Let's put on the breastplate of righteousness. Let's put on the helmet of salvation. Let's be shod with the feet of preparation. How do we get ready for the Lord? Turn around and tell somebody that God is good to me. How do we get ready for the Lord? Tell your family that God is a way maker. How do we get ready for the Lord? Let's pray a little bit more. Let's sing a little bit more. Let's serve a little bit more. Let's love a little bit more. Let's rejoice a little bit more. Let's give a little bit more. Let's fellowship a little bit more. Let's be kind a little bit more. Cause that day is coming. I can reach my limits here. But one glad morning when this life is over, I'm gonna fly away and I wanna be ready. Church, I wanna be ready. I wanna be ready to see him when he come. The good news about reaching your limits in Christ mean that when I'm weak, then am I strong. When I run out down here, I'm connected to a God that sits high and looks low. And when my life is over, I have the blessings of the Lord that when life is over down here, I'll be with the Lord forever and ever. I don't call East Bay no more, y'all. I don't still have the Magic Johnson Converse. But I do have a promise that salvation is mine. Deliverance is mine. And a home in glory is mine. And if you are here today, you've never surrendered your heart to Jesus, will you open up and ask Jesus to come in? God loves you. He died for you. Real simple. Every one of us are going to die. And every one of us are going to have a choice. There's a heaven and there's a hell. And if you cannot say without a surety that you're going to heaven, then you may be going to hell. Because there are many paths that will lead you to hell. Doing nothing will lead you to hell. Not believing nothing will lead you to hell. Treat folk like nothing will lead you to hell. Not worshiping worth for nothing to lead you to hell. But there's only one path that will lead you to heaven. What could wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So if you're here today while the diggings are standing. God is speaking to your heart. If you're listening online. Simple. Ask Jesus Christ to forgive you for your sins. Secondly, ask him to become Lord and Savior of your life. And today... You don't have to worry about reaching your limits here on earth. God will become your savior and he'll guide you.